right? This this idea about about religion is creating a a, a difference between the sacred and the profane. And, and I'm, in, I'm inclined to answer this question by saying that it's a question that only makes sense to modern people. Uh, that like, we, we really, you know, we, we, we have set off this, this, this category of like belief in the supernatural as being sort of qualitatively distinct from everything else. I'm not sure that this distinction really would have made sense to the, to the, to the Egyptians. I mean, it's, it's um, like, you know, I don't know. I mean, I mean, do you believe in your bank? I mean, I mean, you, you, I guess, but it's, it's kind of just the way the, it's just how things work, you know? And, and, and what really matters again, I mean, I mean, I mean, do you have to believe that the statue, well, I don't know. I mean, it's just, the statue is just a name that appears on the contract, right? It's, it's a, it's a legal persona, you know? So like, it's, it's a bit like asking, I don't know, do you believe in Sony that Mesopotamian literary culture is fundamentally bilingual? Okay, it is a bilingual literary culture. And what's even more interesting is that both of these languages are dead. <laughs> okay, there's two languages. One is Sumerian and the other one is Akkadian. Sumerian, as you may know, is a, is a language isolate. Uh, we, we don't really know. It's, it, it belongs to no known um, language family. So of course it was aliens. Uh, Akkadian is a Semitic language. It's related to Arabic and Hebrew and these other languages that we know. Um, but even Akkadian, for most of the period of this literary culture, was not a spoken language, right? So there's a third and fourth and fifth language that are the demotic languages that are actually spoken, okay? So we have two dead languages. One is Sumerian, the other one's Akkadian. And what is interesting is that what they tried to do in much of this, this production of, of literary culture is they tried to force these two languages into balance with one another. They tried to force them to be directly translatable word for word between each other, okay? Despite the fact that they have different grammars, okay? Imagine, imagine so for example, you know, imagine that you tried to do this and you tried to take English and make it match up to Chinese and make every single word directly one-to-one -one translatable, okay? That's kind of analogous to what they're, they're trying to do. They're trying to force these languages to say exactly the same thing in exactly the same way. And the, this attempt created this just massive impenetrable, right? That, that's this, this, this literary corpus. But what I think is interesting is that this teaches people a certain habit of thought, which is that they can force the world into balance, right? I mean, it's like a balance sheet. We have Sumerian on one side of the balance sheet, Akkadian on the other side of the balance sheet, and we are going to force them to be equal to one another, okay? Through the power of our ability to manipulate language. That's what accountants do. Accountants have one side of the sheet, they have the other side of the sheet, and they force them to be equal to one another. Okay, so, so, so that's that's part of what I what I what I what I hope people maybe noticed about this about this assignment, right? So, so it's it's. I mean, I think there's there's interesting stuff with the semiotics, right? Just 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 thinking about the difference between beginning at the bottom, and 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 creating these associations that that don't have to be overcoated by categories, right? It's it's it's, it's the opposite way of proceeding from the way that the Greeks think. Um, you know, like, like if you read Aristotle, well, we did read Aristotle. So, so you know, Aristotle, at every sentence in Aristotle is, is, here is the class of things, A. A is divided into Bs and Cs. Of the Cs, there's Ds and Es, right? I mean, this is, if you read, this is why I just don't like Aristotle. I, I'm sorry that I inflicted Aristotle upon you. I really hate Aristotle, but we, he, he's important for our story. But, but that's, that's why he's such a drag to read, right? Is because it's 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 this this urge to taxonomy, and and I just I want I want us to kind of reflect upon the fact that that's not the only way that we can proceed, right? There's the other way of proceeding, which is which is to begin just by listing every possible thing and not worrying too much about about the categories or or by letting the categories kind of emerge um, 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 from from the the manipulation of signs and 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 that I think is interesting and and it's and it's 
something that I kind of try to put into practice in my in my own work. You know, I mean, I mean, some of what I am often frustrated about, uh, particularly in in sort of my my conflicts with Marxists and stuff, is you know, the Marxists are very Aristotelian in their in their categories of thought, right? I mean, they, I mean, I mean. Um, you know, they, they begin by saying, well, we've we've divided up everything into use value and exchange value. These, these are these categories. And now we're going to go interpret the world from these categories. Whereas whereas I'm I'm always stuck here saying like, OK, like, but first, like, maybe let's just make a list of stuff that exists, you know, like like here, here's this coin and here's this coin and and and, and let's 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 make a and then let's let's see how these how these categories emerge um, out of that. And but 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 I think what we have to what we have to kind of understand is is the way that that urge is motivated by well by the needs of, of accounting right because because what are we trying to do we're trying to make everything that we might account for commensurable in terms of one standard unit right they all have to be they all have to be uh, they have to be able to to be compared to one another in quantitative terms and 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 this means that we rather than paying attention to details, paying attention to the heterogeneity of phenomena, we begin by trying to eliminate all of the details, eliminate all the heterogeneity of phenomena because we decided in advance that that must not matter <laughs> because what matters must have no character. It must have no particular character, right? So in order for money to come to be the standard of value, it has to lose all of its particular determinations, right? Because it stands for simply what, category, what, what commodities have in common in the abstract. And so to the extent that money itself has particular determinations, it's not standing for this abstract metaphor of value, right? And so we get this idea that what happens to money in history is, is that it gradually loses all of its particular determinations and, and therefore becomes more equal to its concept of being this absolutely indeterminate abstract reality that lies behind all appearances, right? And, 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 and part of what I'm trying to suggest is, is that this, this might be a dead end in thinking about money and and that what we really want to do is is to pay attention to the particularity of of money the way the way in which it in fact differs from all of the other things that it that it comes into relation to yeah okay.